Ladies and gentlemen, that's right. You got the American Adversaries on a Trump and Tuesday brought to us by Sutherland Nissan. And uh, by the way, we're going to run commercial free to the top of the hour. Compliments of Sutherland Nissan so we can give this next guest as much time as we can. Michael McBath, Michaela Getz, Randy Ross, and myself, Christopher Hart, in the Relax and Comfort studio. This gentleman, I had the opportunity to meet him briefly at the Black Robe Regiment Conference this past weekend. Great conference. And uh, he gave one of the most powerful powerful speeches there and uh, he literally is on the front line of the cultural and spiritual battle that we have going on in our country right now so I'd like to welcome to the show Jeffrey Younger. Jeffrey thanks for being with us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. Well first of all tell people briefly who you are I've kind of done that prior to you being on with us right now but tell them briefly who you are and tell them what the consequences may be for you doing this interview. Well, um, I'm, I'm fighting the chemical castration and sexual mutilation of my son and sex change surgery. Um, my ex-wife has been trying to transition my son since he was two years old, and I've been in court fighting her now for six years of continuous litigation. Courts have just let it happen and happen and happen. I tried to pass a law this year during our Texas legislative session to outlaw uh, sexual mutilation surgeries on minors at gender clinics. And Republicans in Texas blocked it. What? Uh, I'm um, I'm heading to court uh, again on July second. Uh, I'm under a gag order to not tell my fellow citizens what the government is doing uh, in the courts and what it is allowing to happen. What is allowing to happen to children in these gender clinics? Um, and I'm facing a year in jail, fifty thousand dollars in fine, and ten years of probation on July second. And that's just for speaking out to the public, correct? That is correct. Well, then why are you doing it? There's two reasons for it. One, I've, I've personally decided that I am not going to follow unconstitutional mandates, orders, or laws anymore. That if, it, if it's pretty clear the Supreme Court, uh, if you look at the election cases, in order to have standing, you have to be directly affected by the law, and if I have to go to jail to strike down these illegal gag orders that family courts are putting on parents, then that's just what I'm prepared to do. My lawyer has a writ of habeas corpus prepared already. I've got a jail bag packed, and I've challenged the judge to send me to jail so I can go to the Texas Supreme Court and challenge the constitutionality of these gag orders. The second reason is that, well, I don't really believe in leadership styles. I believe in one leadership style, lead by example. And with my sons, I cannot morally teach my sons to be cowards. And I will not bow down and fail to protect him, fail to protect all the other children that this has happened to at gender clinics, um, uh, and not speak out and try to stop it. And so I feel a moral duty to my sons to uh, speak out and cooperate with my fellow citizens and teach them what real democracy looks like. Jeffrey, take us back a little bit to the start. How did all this begin? Tell us, how did this happen? Well, my first inkling of it was when my son was two years old, my ex-wife, uh, who's a pediatrician in Capel, Texas, was putting my son into timeouts and saying things like, uh, the monsters only eat boys, which, which I thought was really strange. Uh, when my sons were approaching three, she filed for divorce and pried me out of the house using uh, friends of hers, you know, in the medical community who, uh, you know, were, were influencing psychologists. I moved right up the road about a mile away so I could be with my sons. We had 50-50 custody. And right after my son turned three, he started he started wearing this rag on his head. So I asked him one day why I was doing that. He said, because mommy says I'm a girl. And he was wearing it like it was long hair. And uh, so I whipped out my iPhone. It was the first iPhone video I ever took. And um, I, I, I took a video. And if you go on to YouTube, it went viral. I had millions of views. It's on hundreds of YouTube channels. Just search on YouTube for Mommy Says I'm a Girl. And he tells me right there, Mom's telling him he's a girl. She says, uh, you know, she's putting dress, she's cross-dressing him, putting dresses on him, and his nails, and presenting him to the world as a girl. He even gave him a fake girl's name. And I, I presume that, that you were beside yourself, uh, so what did you do? Well, we remember, we're in the middle of a divorce, so we have a psychologist who's a custody evaluator guy named Blake Mitchell, lives in Frisco, Texas. Uh, I went to him and said, hey, look, she's camping with his gender identity. This is exactly what I was telling you about uh, before. And I showed him the video. Well, he, he not only didn't put the video into his report, 
he accused me of making a false accusation that she was tampering with his gender identity. There was no evidence that she was telling him that he was a girl. And on that basis, they gave me the minimal possession allowable. And so, in essence, they gave your ex-wife, during the divorce proceedings, primary custody of the children. Primary custody. And I got I got less than standard possession time. I got reduced time because I'd made this supposedly false allegation. And um, very quickly, she began to ramp up the cross dress. And eventually, she registered him in school as a girl under his fake girl's name. And the school took her side on this issue. And that's that's when I really started uh, uh, aggressively fighting this. Uh, finally, she started presenting my son as a girl on Facebook and on public-facing web- websites in her business because uh, she's a pediatrician. And uh, that's when I went public with it. Um, and the, um, the response from her was to file a, um, a lawsuit to strip me of all of my parental rights, accusing me of abusing my son simply for... Uh, saying he was a boy and refusing to say that he was a girl, and then we had a you know a million dollar trial uh, in in 2019, and um, the the best transgender experts on both sides uh, in the entire world showed up at that trial in Dallas County. Um, I had experts from the original John Hopkins Clinic, the founders of the transgender medical field. And they all shut their clinics down in the 70s and 80s because they could prove these treatments were actually harming patients. Right. And we're having to relearn that now on children. And the court uh, gave me 50-50 conservator rights, meaning that I was able to block her from chemically castrating my son and putting him into a uh, a gender clinic where he could face um, chemical castration at 8. That's what was in the medical record. They wanted to put him on cross-sex hormones at 10 which would have permanently sterilized him at 10 years of age. And then he was looking at sex change surgery as early as 14. So where does it stand now? Because he's getting ready to turn eight, isn't he? Isn't he like seven years old now? He's nine now. Nine, nine now. I've been able to stop it this long. That's why they're they're pulling the stops out. Well, so um, in, in the court order in 2019, um, I got 50-50 possession time as well as 50-50 conservator rights. And I was to get that 50-50 possession time after a counselor certified that I had been through nine points. And they're the generic nine points that you usually have to go through here in Texas. The things like, you know, unconditionally loving your children, recognizing the signs of bullying, stuff like that. Well, these counselors put together a $4,000 a month counseling regime, and it's now been over a year and a half. And it's very clear to me that they are not going to give me equal possession time. Uh, they refuse to see my son when he's a boy. So this is a really important to know about my case. My son only presents as a girl with his mother. With, with me and everybody else, he presents as a, as a boy. Uh, so it's, it's clinically significant, right, if you're a psychologist? Sure. Well, you need to see the boy from both environments, right? Sure, you would think. Um, these, these, yeah, these court-ordered psychologists have refused to see my son when he comes from my home. And that way they can go into court and say, this boy never presented as a girl to me, I mean, as a boy to me. And they can say, he's always been a girl. We've only seen him as a girl. They're trying to set up their testimony to take my children away from me. And once I saw that, plus I found out that they were affirming my son without my consent. They were teaching him he's a girl, uh, using female pronouns, using his fake girl's name without my consent. Despite the fact that I have two court orders that have found that his name is James Damon Younger, that he's a male by sex and a boy by gender. They were still teaching him that he was a girl. So I revoked consent for the court order counselors to see them. And on that basis, um, my ex-wife, uh, Ann Georgilis, has sought sole custody of the children, and she wants to take all my parental rights again. In particular, she's suing for temporary orders that would give her sole control over medical and psychological decision making and the day she gets that is the day my son will be enrolled at a gender clinic and chemically sterilized mike mcbath has a question yeah jeff i was just wondering how do you cover all these legal bills so i have my own business um and i i have spent all my retirement on this um and then I have a uh, have a donation site, which helps a little bit. Um, if you go to uh, 
uh, Facebook and search for Save James. Save James. Save James page. Mm-hmm. Save. Save James page comes up. It's run by volunteers because uh, the courts have shut down everything I, I put up. Um, and then there's a there's a donation link right at the top, um, and that goes to child care expenses and legal fees. The uh, what about your your ex wife now? If I understand correctly, she had a, a couple of adopted children as well. Is that right? Well, that's what I was told before we were married. Um, one of the children was adopted. Sydney was adopted. Um, she was adopted from my ex-wife's brother, who was a three-time convicted felon in California, and ex- uh, exposed this child to methamphetamine in his mother's mother's womb. Uh, uh, they also uh, abused her with food, and all her teeth were rotted out uh, when she was adopted out. Oh, so and adopted her. That, I didn't know any of this when I got married to Anne, by the way. So she kept um, all this from you? All this from me, yeah. And then, while well, I thought Zoe was adopted as well, it turns out that Zoe was actually from a sperm donor, and Zoe has no father. Uh, and that probably would have made me not want to marry him. I see. What about yeah. your other son? How old is he, and, and what, what's his circumstances? Well, they're twins. Um, they're not identical, but they're twins. Uh so you have James and uh, James uh, Damon and Jude Daniel. Um, I named them after the brothers of Jesus. Uh, Jude, James and Jude are, are physically and cognitively very different, but they're both very honest, uh, sincere children. Um, I have almost no need for discipline with them at my home. Um, I don't even need time out here. Um, I've only had to make one rule since we've been here. They're, they're by, and, by and large very reasonable. Um, Jude is uh, struggling with, um, you know, when he should break the Lord's commandments. You know, he knows that he lies uh, when he's at his mother's house, that that his brother's not a girl. And he struggles with, well, if I have to lie, what other commandments should I break? And when should I break them? And when do we follow the commandments? And so I struggle a lot with his moral education. Michaela Getz has a question for you. Well, first, I want to say thank you so much for sharing this story. It's so important, and I think it's so brave that you're sharing it. I'm sure you know this, but for anyone listening, gender dysphoria is a persistent, ongoing feeling that you're in the wrong body, and that's traditionally the only grounds for surgery or hormones until this point. Had your son demonstrated any of these symptoms, and if not, on what grounds is your wife claiming this that your son is a daughter? Well, the problem is that the pediatricians and the psychologists um, and the doctors in general um, will just uh, immediately affirm any gender identity that a child presents on the first go. So let me give you an example with my son. With a one-hour doctor's appointment with a pediatrician, he was diagnosed with gender dysphoria by the pediatrician. (laughs) With a 30-minute session with a psychologist, he was diagnosed with gender dysphoria and referred to, and this is in the medical records, quote, the medical side of treatment to the gender clinic. And that was, so that's a total, a grand total of one, uh, one hour and a half of expiration of what's going on with my son. Um, if you look at the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, there have to be two, two parts that are together, part A and part B in the diagnosis. And part A basically lists stereotypical activities. So if a child enjoys or consistently, persistently, and insistently exhibits stereotypical behaviors of another gender, and B, has significant social impa- social or emotional impairment from those, they have, quote, gender dysphoria. Uh, every single physician and doctor, even the ones that diagnosed with gender dysphoria, admitted in court that he had no significant emotional or social impairment. So it was impossible, even on their account, for him to have met the gender dysphoria diagnosis. So what is your wife... Secondly... Oh, go on. mm -hmm. No, go on. Secondly, he is not uh, consistent. He doesn't consistently present as the other gender, obviously, because he's a boy at my home. He's not insistent about it, because at my home, he actually threw away all the girls' clothes that were here. Um, And he's not persistent, because he changes all the time. So he doesn't meet any of the criteria for gender dysphoria. Nevertheless, 
um, the custody evaluator uh, still diagnosed him with gender dysphoria after looking into it again, after finding all this out. The bottom line is that the professional bodies have decided that they will affirm a child at any abnormal gender identity that they present with, and they will do so without question. Does Do James and Jude ever ask you not to let them go back to their mother's house? Yes. Jude, um, in a very disturbing display, um, you know, in the backseat of the car, said that, uh, he was dead and tell his mother that he was dead and that he did not want to go back. And um, this is not unusual. Um, he calls it the house of doom. Wow. He doesn't want to go back. James James it, it cries when he goes back. Hmm. Must be tough for you. Randy Ross has a question. You know, I as I researched this story coming into it, I, I had never heard your name before, and I apologize for that. So I got started looking at it, and as the only openly gay member of this radio family, at least here as I aware of it, I am so sorry, because this is exactly why the LGBT community gets such a bad rap. It's because all of a sudden exactly. these things become, I don't know common okay and what i see is child abuse i see direct child abuse here i can't imagine i can't even remember when i was seven years old um but i can tell you this much i i can't imagine my mom trying to tell me to put on girls clothes or or my dad or 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 whatever and it's become so acceptable and the opposite if as a father i'm sure you are like torn because you're being told you are homophobic that you are uh you know, not accepting of your son's true identity. He's seven years old. He know. doesn't know. And I, I apologize well, to you because I, I hate that the gay community has oh, really done this in, in a way that's mean. The gay community is not monolithic. And, hey, yeah, man, you got nothing to apologize to me. The gay community is not monolithic. Uh, and we shouldn't treat the gay community that way. I, I, I'll say a couple of things. One, let me defend the gay community a little bit. Um, you know, my, my uh, fiance. Uh, is an international flight attendant. And so, as you might imagine, we meet a tremendous number of gay males. And uh, some of the absolute most radical right uh, people I know are people, people are gay males. Yep. And uh, I, I couldn't even repeat to you some of the things that have been said. I mean, they are radically against the trans child agenda, radically against it. All of them consider child abuse. Um, we haven't had one single gay male uh, support it. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, I am accused of being homophobic and transphobic and all this stuff. Well, a lot of people don't know this about me, but, you know, I have principles, and as you might guess, I'm a kind of man who lives by those principles, regardless of the consequences. And when I was in the United States Army, uh, I was at the Airborne School, and there was a cook in the 45th Company mess hall, I didn't even know the guy, but they uh, gave him a dishonorable discharge for being gay. Now, a dishonorable discharge in America is worse than a federal felony conviction. I mean, you're ineligible, you're permanently ineligible for everything. I don't even think you get Social Security right. if you've been dishonorably discharged. You're permanently ineligible for everything. No federal employment, no education, no nothing. I mean, you're basically condemned to homelessness for the rest of your life. So it's a, it was reserved for cowardice and battle. So I led a protest uh, across the street from the base, and at one point... Um, I walked across the street and threw something in a trash can on the on the base side of the sidewalk. And on that basis, they prosecuted me for, quote, consorting with homosexuals. And I went to jail for gay rights in the military wow. in the 1980s, long before this stuff was popular. Mm. So I'm not some anti-gay ideologue. I'm not even an anti-trans ideologue. What I am about is uh, allowing children to develop naturally through their adolescence and when they have a developed a rational faculty to make a decision for themselves. Jeffrey, you mentioned earlier that uh, the Re- Republican hierarchy, Governor Abbott, vetoed this bill that had been passed to would make things easier for you. Why did he do that? Well, he did not veto it. What they did was, and this is a common strategy they use here in Texas, they let time expire on bills. Um, and so uh, this was a high priority bill. This is uh, this is a bill that the, the uh, chief of staff of the Speaker of the House told me we put more pressure on the legislature than any bill in the history of Texas. We shut down entire phone trunks at the Capitol. 
some offices were recording 300 lobbyists a day on my bills. We still could not get it passed. Um, there's, there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one of the shocking things about the transgender movement is largely funded by Republicans, not Democrats. Some of the largest Republican donors support the trans agenda. And for years, they were washing their money through Australian NGOs and bringing it back into the country so that that was disguised. There's a very good article you can read by Jennifer Bilek in The Federalist yeah. called Who Are the Rich White Men Funding the Transgender Movement? And the top two on the list are Republicans. Can you give us their names? And so there's uh, Paul Singer and James Pritzker. Paul? James Pritzker, now he calls himself Jennifer Pritzker now, is the one who's funding the child transgender movement. And Paul Singer is a hedge fund billionaire who founded the Human Rights Campaign. Wow. So it's a Republican-led movement. And because of that, you know, Abbott is looking at losing millions of dollars in funding for his upcoming governor campaign right. if he were to let these bills get through. So what they obfuscated, they delayed our bills, they put our, our bill behind 900 other bills on, that had to be passed in one day and there was no possible way to get to it. I see. So then they have a plausibly, plausible deniability, you know, there was just wasn't time to pass it. So they can pass bills, um, you know, making cities in Texas the ice cream capital of Texas. They can pass, right. they have time to pass those bills, but not a bill that would keep children from being sexually mutilated. And now uh, Governor Abbott has not added this issue to the special session. So uh, we know that he's blocking this. All right. Well, listen, I only have a couple of minutes left. Real quickly, your hearing is on July the 2nd, you said. What's going to happen there? And is, is there any resolution to this in sight? What's next? So uh, we're heading toward another trial. We're going to have another million-dollar trial in probably a year and a half or two years before we get there. This, this hearing will set the temporary orders that my children will live under for the next year and a half or two years, so it's very crucial. Um, it's set in person because in Texas you cannot criminally sentence someone remotely. Texas has something called the Confrontation Clause in our Constitution, and every criminal defendant has the right to appeal in person for mercy to a magistrate that's sentencing him criminally. So since this is a criminal contempt charge that they're bringing me up on for breaking this gag order, this hearing will be in person. So it's a very important hearing. My son's life is literally at stake because if she get medical and psychological decision-making powers, soul powers, my son that day will be over at the Genesis Clinic in Children's Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and they will chemically castrate him that week. Real quickly, tell us about the Genesis Clinic. Well, so the Genesis, G-E-M-E-C-I-S, like cisgender, yep. Genesis, yeah, they do that just to just to insult Christians. The Genesis Clinic is a clinic that uh, does hormone treatments to chemically castrate boys and girls. Um, they refer out to surgery. Um, during our discovery, during our lawsuit and depositions, we, uh, one of their experts testified that she had personally referred over 250 pubescent girls out for total mastectomies, and although she didn't know the exact number, more boys for removal of the testicles and penis. Oh, my Lord. Uh, once again, you can help out Jeffrey and his sons at Save James on Facebook. Of course, we're going to be praying for you, wishing for you the best. Thank you so much for filling us in on this. And uh, assuming they don't put you in jail, I'd like to have you back as often as we can so that you can keep us updated on this so we can help you out as much as possible. You bet. I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much. Once again, Jeffrey Younger, a true American. And as I said, he's literally on the front lines of the cultural battle. Michaela? Well, absolutely. We were talking about this, but on my podcast, I'm getting ready to do a multi-part series on gender and the parents who are willing to, to step up and talk about what's happening behind the scenes to their children. And parents like Jeffrey are leading the way in that because they're brave enough to do it. And it takes some guts for this man because, as he said, he's... Basically, in violation oh, of the court order. Determination is phenomenal. But it's more.